Powerful, huh? Um, welcome. Really glad that you're here. Uh, if we haven't met, my name's Ryan. I'm one of our pastors here and just really grateful that you've joined us for worship. If you're joining us in the chapel or online, we are so thankful that you are here also. I don't know if you had the chance to come in our sort of the doors on the north side of the building, but did you see the new awning that's going up there? Really, really exciting. Yes, one person's excited. Praise be to God. You know what the really cool thing about that is, is that it's um, Jim and our men on a mission who are doing the majority of the work there, and they are just doing a stellar job. I'm really thankful for their ministry to our church. Well, we are jumping into week two of a series in 1 Corinthians that we're going to be in for the better part of 2022 together. And so if you have your Bible, let me invite you to open to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. At the end of 2021, Disney released their newest animated film. It's entitled Encanto. Anybody seen it? I see those hands in the chapel too. Right on. Yeah, it, it was a, fa- a movie that my family and I sat down to watch right after Christmas. And it just sort of drew us in. Great storyline. Phenomenal music. In fact, one of the songs from the movie is number four on the Billboard charts. It's the highest that any song from a Disney movie has hit in the last 26 years. The song is entitled... We don't talk about Bruno. Have you heard this on the radio? We don't talk about Bruno, no, no, no. Anybody? Three people, wonderful. All of you hung me out to dry. I really thought you might jump in there. Uh, The the song in so many ways captures the theme of the movie. The movie is based around this Colombian family and the family is being driven apart by the, the lapse in the powers that they've enjoyed for so long. If you drill down, the movie really is about division within family. It's about trauma. It's about healing. And for that reason, the movie has captured the hearts and minds of audiences all over. In so many ways, it echoes the story that a lot of us seem to be living. Especially in this sort of COVID environment where there's differing opinions that we have. It seems like families and close friendship groups are splintering all over the place. We live in a time where we don't talk about Bruno. There are people who are on the outskirts that have been divided and separated from us. And unfortunately, that's a reality that happens not just outside of the church, but also inside of the church, isn't it? There's a story about this man who was driving down the road in rural Indiana and he came upon a car that was pulled over because they had gotten a flat tire. There was a man standing next to the car and he didn't know how to replace and put on the spare. Uh, The man got out of his car and went up to this gentleman standing on the side of the road and he said, do you need help? And the man said, yeah, I need help putting on my spare. And the man responded and said, well, are you a a Christian, a, a Jew or a Hindu? And the man said, well, I'm a Christian. And the man said, well, great, so am I. He said, are you, are you a Protestant or are you a Catholic? And he said, well, I'm a Protestant. And the man responded, wonderful, so am I. What denomination are you? And he said, well, I'm a Baptist. And the man responded, great, so am I. Are you Northern Baptist or Southern Baptist, the man said. And he said, well, I'm Northern Baptist. And he said, great. So am I. The man responded again and he said, well, are you Northern Conservative Baptist or are you Northern Liberal Baptist? And the man who had the broken down car said, well, I'm Northern Conservative Baptist. And the man responded, wonderful, so am I. And he said, well, well, are you Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist or are you Northern Conservative Reform Baptist? And the man said, well, I'm Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist. And the man said, wonderful, so am I. And he looked at him and said, Well, are you Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes region or are you Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Eastern region? And he said, well, I'm Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes region. And the man looked at him and went, what a miracle, so am I. And he said, well, are you Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes region Council 1897 or are you Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes region 
Council 1912, and the man said, I'm Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912. And the man looked at him and said, you heretic. And he got in his car and he drove off, leaving him on the side of the road. It would, if, if you're wondering, um, took me about an hour to memorize all that. So I feel like it was time well spent. It, it would be funnier, though, if there weren't a hint of truth there, wouldn't it? I don't know about you, I, I spent some of my time on this Monday reflecting on the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a prophetic voice to the church in the West. And one of the, the most striking quotes that he's remembered for is when he said, it's appalling that the most segregated hour of Christian America is, an ele- is 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning. And he was talking about ethnic divides and racial divides, and certainly there is still progress to be made 60 plus years after Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. made this statement. But those divides are theological in nature, they're ethnic in nature. In fact, I would argue that division is not just um, a family problem, it's not just a church problem, it's a, a human problem in so many ways. I think division is sort of the natural course that we, we run when we give into our sin nature. Yeah, yeah, even within the church, there are times where we don't talk about Bruno. There are divisions that run deep. Did you know that there are over 200 major Protestant denominations right now? And that doesn't include the tens of thousands of sort of splinter sects that have divided off from them. And let me be honest, let me be honest with you. I think that should trouble us. I think it should cause us to to pause. And and here's why I think that. I believe that it troubled the Apostle Paul. It's one of the very first things he addresses to when writing to this church in Corinth If you were with us last week, you know that the intro to the letter to the Corinthians, Paul draws out the reality that the church is sanctified saints. And then he promises them in the midst of Corinth, where it's really, really challenging to be a Christ follower, God will be faithful. But then, at the very turn into the body of his letter, you know the very first thing he addresses is? Division within the church. Commentator Gordon Fee calls this one of the most significant moments in all of Christian scripture. Let that sink in for a moment. One of the most significant moments in all of Christian scripture. If you have your Bible open to 1 Corinthians, we're going to be starting in verse 10 as we jump into this next section in this great letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. Listen to the way he begins this section. He says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, now just a quick time out. Paul the Apostle is um, coming to them in a very heartfelt, passionate Not heavy-handed and not domineering. He sort of senses pastor's heart coming through. He's not commanding them. He's he's appealing to them. Like, Like, come on, you guys. Come on. That all of you agree. That there be no division among you. But that you be united in the same mind, in the same judgment. There are three things that Paul appeals to them for. Number one, that you all, what? Agree. I don't know that it's a great translation of the Greek word. The Greek word literally means, I I long that you all say the same thing. It It seems as though that in Corinth, people from the church were giving different messages to those outside of the church, and people were getting confused. What's the core message of the church? And Paul says, I I want you to all say the same thing. And then he says that there be no divisions among you. That That word literally could mean to tear or to rip. Paul says that's that's going on inside of the church. There's this tearing and there's this ripping that's going on. And then he calls them to be united. In the Greek, it carries with it this picture of all the pieces fitting together perfectly. You can almost imagine Paul being a tent maker, writing to the church, and and he has this vision in mind of the way that the tents that he would craft fit together perfectly so that no rain seeped in. And he goes, that's the way that I 
I envision the church operating and, and the church functioning. That word united is the same word that's used when the disciples are, are mending their nets. It's a bringing back together of that which was torn apart. Now, now here's what I want you to capture. When Paul is challenging the church to lean into being a unified body, what he's not saying is that there needs to be uniformity. He's not saying that we all need to uh, look the same and talk the same and just like robots just sort of click in and this is the way you do it. No, if you go and you read Galatians chapter 2, you'll see that the apostle Peter and the apostle Paul didn't exactly see eye to eye on everything. And you know, it's possible, it's possible to have unity with people that you don't see eye to eye with on every little thing. Somebody say, thank goodness. <laughs> thank goodness. And then he explains why he's addressing this in this letter. Look at verse 11. For it's been reported to me by Chloe's people that there's quarreling among you. In many ways, you could split the letter of 1 Corinthians in half. Part of the letter is Paul responding to what he's hearing is going on in Corinth. This is part of that. And then part of the letter is Paul responding to questions that the church had. How do we handle this situation and what are we supposed to do here? And so we see that this idea of divisions, Paul's addressing it because he's hearing from Chloe's people... Chloe was a leader in the church in Corinth. She was thought to be pretty wealthy, so wealthy that she had people. She was one of their leaders. And she sends them, go talk to Paul and ask him what we should do about this. Tell him what's going on and ask him how to handle it. This word quarreling in the Greek is the word eris. And it's uh, quite literally the, the goddess who evokes war. So this isn't some light disagreement. It seems as though the lines have been drawn, the sides have been chosen, the us's are there, the them's are there, and the church is divided. The church is divided. Now here's my question. Why in the world would the Apostle Paul start off a letter to one of the churches that he planted and that he loves, and why would he address, before he addresses anything else, unity. Why, why would he spend the parchment and put this in such a prominent place in his letter? See, because here's, here's what Paul knew. Paul knew the exact same thing that Jesus knew. It's that a house divided cannot stand. Listen to the way that Jesus said it. He was accused of driving out demons by using the power of the devil. And Jesus responds logically to the Pharisees. Here's what he says. He says, knowing their thoughts, he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. And no city or house divided against itself will stand. And I think you could apply this not just to cities or to houses, but you can, you can apply this to nations. No nation divided against itself will stand. You, you can apply this to marriages. No marriage divided will stand. You can, apply the, you can apply this to churches. No churches divided will stand. See, for the Apostle Paul, unity is of the utmost importance because division leads to destruction. Division leads to destruction. I think what Paul is saying to the church in Corinth is without unity, there is no path forward doesn't matter what else he says in this letter. If they aren't unified, they have no path forward because division leads to destruction. It's the very reason that when Jesus was praying for his church, his disciples in the garden, listen to one of the things he prayed for them. I do not ask this for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Do you know who he's praying for? Us. Raise your hand. Us us, that they might believe in you through their word, that they, we, may be, say it with me, manual faith, one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that, why does Jesus pray so ardently for unity? 
Because when we are unified, the world may believe that you have sent me. See, Jesus prays for unity because he knows that our evangelistic effectiveness depends on it. Jesus knew that if his church was divided, it was doomed to be defeated. In the same way that a country who's involved in a civil war has no ability to take new ground, so too a church divided has no ability to further the message of the good news of the gospel. And so Paul lays all of this out and he puts his heart on a page. He appeals to them, be unified. And then he's going to do two things after that. First, he's going to diagnose their problem. He's going to say, here's where you went wrong, church in Corinth. And then he's going to give them the solution. So first, the problem. Here's what he said. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, which is the Aramaic name for Peter, or I follow Christ. (laughs) So what caused the division within the Corinthian church? Well, see, after the apostle Paul planted the church and left, there were other teachers that came in. Good teachers. Teachers like, well, Apollos and Cephas came in and they started to teach the church in Corinth. And evidently, there were people within the church that went, gosh, I really like what these guys are saying. That's a powerful message. Like he's, really, he's really bringing it. And I think we need to realize what was going on in the culture of Corinth in order to get the depth of what Paul is saying here. See, in Corinth, at the time that Paul's writing, there is um, something going on called sophistry. It comes from the root word Sophia in the Greek, which means wisdom. And these sophists were teachers who were traveling around and they would show up in a place like Corinth and people would come out and they would hear their rhetoric and they would be blown away oftentimes. And these sophists were collecting a following. But here's the thing about sophists. This was big business, number one. So therefore, they had to talk bad about the other sophists. You're following them? I can't believe you'd follow them. My rhetoric is way better than theirs, don't you think? And you would start to have these um, lines that were dividing between certain sophists. And what I think is going on, and what most commentators think is going on in 1 Corinthians, is that they have rolled this idea of sophistry into the way that they interact with teachers in the church. I follow Paulos. I follow Paul. I follow Cephas. so glad that this doesn't happen anymore. (laughs) I mean, this is pre-Instagram, where we literally are following certain people, right? And, And people develop a platform, right? This is going on in our world still today. There's people that divide along the lines of who they follow. I follow Swindoll. I follow MacArthur. I follow Jeremiah. I follow Willard. I follow Comer. Or or those don't apply? I follow Doc. Oh, that that was too much. (laughs) I follow Dennis. I follow Ryan. Ryan. But right? I mean, we, we do the same thing. And, and here's what we often think. Well, it's, it's not that big of a deal. And indeed, I think it starts off good. Right? I, I think it starts off for two reasons. Number one, somebody makes a significant impact in our life. And we go, my goodness, the way that God spoke through that person to me, I am forever changed because of that. And it starts off really good. Or maybe it's, gosh, the way that they present the good news that's found in the scriptures, I just really connect with that. It's a preference, a personality where we go, yes, thank you. I mean, I can imagine people within Corinth going, Apollos, he's just, his oratory skills are just so off the charts. He's he's amazing, right? Or I can imagine people going, Peter, like, 
he's got just the right amount of law in there. Or maybe Paul, gosh, he's been broken and he understands grace. That message is just hitting home. And it starts off good. But what the Apostle Paul is pointing out that it can happen that because of, past, because of preference and because of past impact, Jesus can get lost in the shadow in some of our minds and hearts. And so what do we do to mend that? That, that's, that's what happened in Corinth, and that's why they were divided. And then Paul gives the anecdote to what's going, the antidote to what's going on. Here's what he says. Is Christ divided? Was, was Paul crucified for you? Now, just a quick time out. I love that Paul includes himself in the names of leaders that need to be called off of pedestals. Because in so many ways, it wasn't the leaders themselves who were doing it. It it wasn't Apollos trying to build a platform or Cephas or Paul. It was the people who were putting them on that platform. And Paul's saying, no, 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 no. You need to take me off of that. I wasn't crucified for you. It, It wasn't me who gave my life for you. There was only one who did that. His name is Jesus, right? Or were you baptized into the name of Paul? I love the way that he starts addressing this. So what can mend division? I think Paul hits on it in his second question he asks. Was Paul crucified for you? Like, did, did, did I go that far for you, Paul says? And the answer to that is no, no. And I think what he's pointing out for the church, for the early church and for our church is that focus on the cross destroys division in the most beautiful way. Division destroys, but focus on the cross destroys division. Friends, let's just take a step back from this and remember that the cross is the very thing that brings unity in the first place. And it's also the very thing that preserves it. Paul made this statement when he was writing, writing to the church in Ephesus and he said, and might reconcile, speaking of the work of Christ, might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross. He's speaking of Jews and Greeks, Gentiles, being united in one body. How? Through the, through the cross and thereby killing hostility. The cross is the way that Jesus united his church originally, and it's the very way that he still preserves unity today. When the cross is rightly valued, divisions start to cease. Now, you may be wondering, like, how, how does that work? Why is that, why is that the case, and why is that true? That's a great question. I'm so glad you asked that. And as I've read through the rest of this passage and tried to sort of draw out from it what Paul's saying and the point he's making, there's three things that stood out to me. Reasons the cross brings unity. Here's the first. When we focus on the cross and when the cross is central, we exalt the right person. We exalt the right person. Remember Paul's statement was, was Paul crucified for you? No. There's only one who is crucified for you. His name is Jesus. And Paul is making the point that atonement is the only thing that earns our complete allegiance. Because Jesus gave his life for us, because he lived and died on our behalf and was resurrected that we might have new life in him. He is the only one who deserves the preeminent spot in our worship, in our lives. We bow to one. His name is Jesus. If you believe it, say amen. And there's no like 1A. Oh yeah, and Paul. And Cephas. And Apollos. No, no, no. What Paul is saying is it's all about Jesus. It would be like going to a movie, watching the movie where there's a breathtaking performance by the main actress and walking away and talking about the way that that extra did a really good job when the crowd was gathered together. No one would do it. And yet Paul's saying it's happening in the early church and... And maybe it happens in churches still today. 
Now, as Jesus is exalted, we have to remember what Paul said at the very first question he asked in verse 13. Look back at it with me. Is Christ divided? What's the answer to that? Let me hear you in uh, in the chapel. Is Christ divided? No. No. Christ is unified. Christ is one. So if you are in Christ, you are part of one big, sometimes happy, family. One big family. It's the reason that the earliest church creed called the Apostles' Creed made this statement. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church. The communion of saints. What, what are they? What, when we say the Apostles' Creed, when we say those lines, what are we saying? And many people have an issue with the Catholic Church. It's, it's, it's lowercase c. It's not talking about the Roman Catholic Church. That word Catholic means universal. It means every follower of Jesus that has ever pledged allegiance to his name throughout all time. The Apostles' Creed is saying we are part of one big family together. See, from the beginning, friends, there has only been one family of God. He does not have sister wives. Okay, there is one bride of Christ, the church. And when we get to heaven, our man-made divisions will cease because we will exalt one name above all other names, the name of Jesus. And the only people there will be people who pledge allegiance to him, who bow down around his throne, and who claim that he is king and he is God. He's the great unifier. In heaven, there will only be people who worship Jesus, period, hard, stop. One family. One family. See, the cross builds unity because it exalts the right person. But second, here's what it does next. Keep reading. Verse 14. I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that none of you could say that you were baptized into my name. And then you just imagine Paul scratching his head a little bit. And maybe he looks over at Sosthenes, who's sitting next to him while he's writing this. And he said, I... I did also baptize the household of Stephanus. And beyond that, I don't know whether I baptized anyone else. You imagine him looking at Sosthenes and going, can you remember anyone? And Sosthenes is like, no. He goes, let's just go with it, right? Let's just, let's just go with it. And why does the Holy Spirit guy carry Paul along to include this in what we would now call sacred holy scripture. Because here's what he wanted to point out to the church in Corinth. It's not about who baptized you. It's about who died for you. That's the important thing. And do you know what? In doing that, in lifting high the cross, and in some ways minimizing who baptized each person, do you know what happens? And the way it brings unity is that not only does it exalt the right person, it elevates the right doctrine. It elevates the right doctrine. I mean, think for a moment how many doctrinal issues are related to the cross. Jesus' incarnation, our sin and the need for redemption, Jesus' substitution, dying on our behalf to remove the wrath of God, to remove the penalty for sin resurrection and life eternal. I mean, it's all encompassed in the cross. And when you start peeling back the onion that we call Christianity, at the core, what you find is the cross. It is the central doctrine to everything that we believe as followers of Jesus. Now, here's the deal. I'm convinced and firmly believe that good doctrine is really, really important. But as we look back through the ages of church history, we also see that doctrine is one of the things that divides followers of Jesus most. So so here's what I want to say. I believe it's important that you know what you believe. And I believe that it's important that you have really, really good doctrine. And we'll do our best to continue to teach that and continue to encourage that. But I just want to also press on you in the same breath and say, yeah, yeah, but, but unity requires humility. It requires that even though we're convinced of something, we go, 
I'm going to listen and I'm going to respect and I'm going to interact with people who may see this doctrine a little bit differently than me. I'm going to treat them with honor and with respect. And if we're humble, it's possible to be united, even with people that we don't agree with on every single topic. I love the way that uh, Rupertus Meldinius put it when he said, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, in all things, charity or love. And so he would say, do you know what's really, really important when it comes to unity within the church? You have to ag- agree on what's essential. What's essential? And the Apostle Paul, in writing to the church in Corinth, probably not intending to give us an exhaustive list, but what we have at the top, above anything else, what's essential? The cross. The cross. Because the cross exalts the right person. And the cross calls us to elevate the right doctrine. And then there's one final way. One final thing the cross does. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Just a few things that I want to point out. Number one, right here, Paul equates what we would call gospel or the good news with what? The cross. The cross. Those two things are never separated. The cross is the good news that Jesus has brought the kingdom of God right here, right now, and that he has redeemed humanity by his blood and called us to be a part of his family once again. He's removed the penalty of sin and invited us into his family. This is the good news. And Paul says, that's why I was sent. That's why I was sent. I don't think he's demeaning baptism, but he is putting it in its place. He's going, listen, uh, baptism hasn't saved anyone. Paul's going front and center. The thing that I was called to do is to preach gospel, which is to preach the cross. And when the cross is central, when the cross is our focus, we as a church body embrace the right mission. We embrace the right mission. You think about how important embracing the right mission is and how it brings unity. We see this all around us in our culture, don't we? You see this in sports teams? They are on mission together, right? And that mission brings them together. May the uh, Green Bay Packer fans, may may God console you today, right? (laughs) But the Packers were on mission. They fell short, but they were on mission and Cowboy fans and Bronco fans always. May God be with us, right? We, we see this in uh, Band of Brothers, right? Where there are people on mission, men on mission together. And what does it do? It unites their hearts together. It calls them to one another, not just to the mission. But when the church functions at a mission deficit, divisions fester. When you see a church that's divided or complaining or cynical, what you are actually looking at is a church that's lost sight of its mission. It's either focusing too much on making the people there happy or preferences of a few. On the other hand, you show me a church that's unified and I will show you a church that says, we know why we exist. So here's my question. Do we know the mission? Do we know the mission? In my reading this week, I I stumbled across an article on the Iditarod, this amazing race that takes place from Anchorage, Alaska, up to Nome. It's over a thousand miles where um, mushers and dog sleds travel and they, they race. But I don't know if you know this, but the Iditarod didn't start off as just a race. It started off in 1925 when there was an illness that broke out in Nome, Alaska, and the only medicine they had in order to cure this illness was in Anchorage. And they needed to get those vials of this medicine up to Nome in order to preserve the lives of many kids that were living there. And so they took off and they started to, quote unquote, race up there. They called it the great race of mercy. And over a thousand miles through the bitter cold, they said, we have got to go forward. (laughs) 
Did you know in the last almost 100 years of running this race, they have never topped their first time? They, they, they race a very similar path. It looks very similar to the way it looked back then, but the mission is different. The mission is let's win the race rather than let's save lives. I wonder if the same is true for the church in the West. I wonder if we've lost sight of the heart of the mission. Like we have the forms, but, but are we really bought in on the mission? And you go, what's the mission? The mission is, just like Jesus told his disciples to go and make disciples in all the nations, the mission is what Paul wrote to the church in Corinth at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. All this is from God, who through Christ has reconciled to himself and has given us, Emmanuel Faith, given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins or trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Friends, we exist as a church body to hold out the good news that Jesus Christ is king over all and that by his blood shed on the cross and his resurrection from the grave, he has reconciled us to God. Let's be so busy with that mission that we don't have time for division. Can I get an amen? amen. Let's make that what we are all about. I got this picture the other day of what I think this might look like within the church body. For those of you that know me, this, this won't shock you, but uh, my dog had destroyed a strand of Edison light bulbs in our backyard. And what I realized that they weren't just light bulbs, they were actually a trellis. We have this wonderful jasmine bush that's grown up one of its trellises and it started to just grow around these Edison light bulbs. And I don't know how many strands of jasmine there are, but they are all wrapped around this strand of light bulbs that my dog destroyed. May he rest in peace. And, um, <laughs> And as I was trying to get a new strand in there, I thought, gosh, what a great picture of the way that God has designed his church. That we would all grow around one trellis. That that would be at the center point of everything that we do and everything that we are. And that trellis is no other than his cross. That that would be at the center point of why we exist as a church. Because when the cross is central and when the cross is the focus, the right person is exalted, the right doctrine is elevated, and the right mission is embraced. In fact, Jesus said it like this. When I am lifted up, speaking of his cross, I will draw all men, all people to my Self. And if we're all drawn to him, then we are drawn to each other also, aren't we? Yeah, see, when we gather around Jesus, we grow together. Let's make that our commitment as a church. I love the fact that this is where Paul begins the letter of 1 Corinthians. I think he starts here because he knows that if we don't get this right, it doesn't matter what we get right. A house divided cannot stand. Division destroys. But when the cross is central, division itself is destroyed. Let's pray. Let's pray. I just want to give you a second to pause and to just bring all that we've talked about before the Lord you ask the Spirit of God to just to stir in you? If you're out in the chapel, I'd just invite you to do the same. And if you're here today and you're saying, man, Ryan, that, that, that's me. Like, there's, there's division in my, in my family, in my life. And, and I want Jesus to begin that healing process and show me how he's already at work. Or maybe you would even be so bold as to say, gosh, I've been a cause of some division and, and I want to be part of the balm of healing and lifting Jesus high. 
If, that's, if either one of those is you, if you're saying, this is for me and Jesus, I need you to bridge the division that is very real in my life or you've been a part of division, would you just raise your hand? I just want to pray for you. Pray for you. Yeah, I see. Right on. All around. Okay. Let me pray for you. So Lord, we come before you today humbly. And we would ask, would you move and work, search our hearts, point out if there's any way offensive or off within us. And we, des- we, we long to give you all the power, all the glory, all the honor. You deserve it all. And so, Jesus, my prayer for every person, those, especially those who raise their hands, that as we lift you high in our life and in our families, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, as we, as we lift you high, would you bring us together? God, for areas of division, even within our church, within our community, within your world, God, would you bring us together? We believe that we're better together than we are separate. But that's not easy. So help us forgive where we need to forgive. Help us speak truth where we need to speak truth. Help us walk humbly in all situations. And Jesus, would you help us to be people of love? Knowing that that's how you have treated us. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen.